Thanks for being with us today. Uh, Pastor Larry has us going to the book of Romans, chapter 13, Unlimited Debt to Love. And, and um, I, I will say this, Romans is one of those books, if you've not read the book of Romans, I would recommend you do it. it it's, uh, it's a deep book. Uh, remember that Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote to the church in Rome, which was Christians, both Gentiles and uh, as well as Jews. And when he wrote the book of Romans, he really covered a lot of how-tos. Um, and, and that to me is pretty important. So if you've never read the book of Romans, I would challenge you to think about doing that uh, this coming week. It's, uh, it, it's, it's deep. Um, and remember, I always encourage people, you can read scripture in a couple of different ways. You can read it like you would the newspaper. You're looking for the highlights and, and there's nothing wrong with that. that. That's perfectly legitimate. And then you can go back and analyze every verse, every word. Um, you can see the interrelationship from one chapter to another. And you could even study it so deep. If you have a study Bible, it might have out to the right or the left side of the scripture columns. It may have related scriptures and you can follow all that. So um, even if you read the book of Romans like a newspaper or a, a quick reader's digest version, um, I, I encourage that this week. I, I really would challenge you to read the book of Romans. It's a great book. So Pastor Larry, uh, this is All Saints Day. And, um, you know, it's a time when we remember those who have gone on before us. We remember those who are with us. And Pastor Larry fittingly says, unlimited debt to love. So um, I don't believe that I see... Um, Stacy Painter. She was here this morning and went home. She probably hadn't made it home yet. So <clears throat> I'm going to read from Romans chapter 13, 8 through 14. So as I always like to do, and Kim Campbell, you've got to pass, okay? You don't have to stand up. Uh, Kim's still suffering with a back issue, but uh, if we could, we'll stand for the holy reading of God's word. So Romans 13, 8 through 14, the New International Version says it this way. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. And you know, recently we studied this and Pastor Larry took us through that part of the scripture. So in verse 10, Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now, I'll just stop there for a moment. Paul is constantly trying to use word pictures to teach people and to get the point across. So, so look at that again. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness. So take off the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. I like that. Verse 13, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, close yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God indeed, and please be seated. So, as I told you earlier, and I believe very fittingly, Pastor Larry has titled this part of Romans, he titled uh, the sermon today, Unlimited Debt to Love unlimited debt to love. So I think it's appropriate. We have to ask the question, love is a debt. And notice the question mark at the end, love is a debt. So what does it mean, love is a debt? Somebody care to answer that? How is love a debt? Thank you. 
Well, Kim? We, we certainly owe Jesus for um, his love for us, that he died to save us. So we owe him to try to bring others to help fulfill that debt. So that that is a very true statement, Kim. And, and really, to some degree, you've kind of summarized some of the gospel here. Um, so love is a debt, a question mark. And to some, it is easy to answer that, yes, love is a debt. We, we owe the debt of love. And Kim, you actually, as always, because you're such a good student, you immediately answered question number two. So thank you, thank you for taking that away from me, Kim. And that was, why are we responsible for that debt? And if you heard Kim, she said, it's because Jesus died for us and we owe that debt to him. How, how do we, question number three on your outline is, how do we usually approach debt? How do you approach debt? If you owe money or you owe a favor or you owe somebody something, how do you usually approach that debt? What, what goes through your mind, Pam? Installments, a little bit of okay. time. Ongoing. Okay, good. A little bit at a time. Okay, uh, good. That's a good way to put it. Anybody else? So I want, I want you to think gone. you want it gone. Okay, so you want to be done with that obligation, right? Okay, okay, that's fair, Barb. Anybody else? All right. I'm going to get deep with you for a minute, okay? So, so I want you to follow me. Usually, a debt indicates that we have an obligation. We have a responsibility. We have a commitment, a covenant, an agreement, however you'd like to say it, that we owe whatever that debt is, we have agreed that we are going to take care of it, right? Right? It becomes an obligation. For some, it is an obligation that we wish we didn't have. And that's fair. Um, many of us about our home mortgage or maybe a uh, college debt or uh, a debt that we had to incur perhaps for a vehicle. Um, we, we often look at that and say, I, I wish I didn't know this. So sometimes when we think about our faith walk, it would be much easier if we didn't have a debt, if we didn't have an obligation. It'd be a lot easier, wouldn't it, to, to just say, well, Jesus, I, I don't want to make that commitment. I don't want to have that agreement. I don't want that covenant. I don't want that obligation or responsibility. So when we approach debt, most people say it's something I'd rather not have but it's necessary. Um, there was no other way for me to be able to get what I got without borrowing or being obligated to that debt. I want you, though, to think about this. Let me speak to you as a business guy for a moment. Debt is simply a tool that we can use to achieve an ultimate goal. So many times in business, we approach banking relationships in ways that we recognize there are costs to that, associated responsibilities and covenants and obligations. In fact, most every commercial obligation that I sign, it says covenant at the top of it, much like we talk about the covenant we have in our church, relationships that we have in church. So I always see debt in my business as a way to achieve an ultimate goal. Now, I want you to think for a moment. It's perfectly natural for us to look at a debt, an obligation and say, I wanna get this thing over as quick as I can. It's pressure. I don't like owing something. That's one way to look at it. And there's nothing wrong with that. But what if I can shift your thinking to where you look at it like I do in business is it is a tool 
to be able to achieve the, the ultimate goal. It happens to be a pathway for us to get where we want to be. Now, if we look at the debt of love that we agree we owe as a result of our relationship with Jesus Christ, that he paid the debt first for us, suddenly, if you don't look at it as a, an obligation that I want to get rid of as fast as I can, but an, a situation where now with that debt that I owe Jesus it is getting me on the pathway to where I need to be and where he wants me to be. Maybe for some of you, just that slight change in the way you see things. Maybe instead of looking at it this way, you look at it this way. That might be helpful to some of you. Maybe not to all of you, but to some of you. Now, in your outline, the fourth point is, what does unlimited mean? What does unlimited mean? Anybody? So we talk about... Pastor, pastor, oh, hold on just a second, Pam. Good, good point, but hold on. When we look at Pastor Larry's le lesson title, it's called Unlimited Debt to Love. So what does unlimited mean? Go ahead, Pam. I was going to say infinite. Infinite, that's a great word. Anybody else? To infinity and beyond. There you go, Buzz Lightyear. That's, I love Buzz Lightyear. Yep, to infinity and beyond, yep. How about unlimited for anybody else? Now. Everlasting. Everlasting. Good, good choice, Beverly. Good choice. Now look at the next point in your outline. What's another churchy term that we use for unlimited? What's another churchy word that we use for unlimited? Everlasting. There's an, Everlasting, that's fair, but um, I got one in particular. It's, it's a Greek word, and the Greeks use it to describe a type of love. Omniscient? No, good, good thought. Agape? Agape, that's it. Agape. Remember that the Greeks, um, the English language sometimes is not as... Um, as diverse. It, it isn't as descriptive as some of the Greek language. And so um, I'm not, but if we go back and look at some of the words that are used by the Apostle Paul, because he more than likely wrote all this in Greek, um, it, it has better words and more words for the same thing. So the Greeks have four different words for love. One of those words is agape. And it kind of means unlimited, but here's how we describe it. It means unconditional love. Agape love is unconditional love. So it's not a perfect alignment of definition. It's not a perfect alignment, but it's reasonably good in my view. And that is, Pastor Larry used the word unlimited debt to love. And if we said, what about unconditional debt to love? So unconditional in that definition is unlimited. So I wanted to think of an umbrella here and, and give you even a bigger viewpoint that Pastor Larry touched on today, and I believe Paul touches on as well, and Jesus does on a regular basis. And that is, we have unlimited, unconditional debt to love. There aren't any conditions to this debt. In a typical debt instrument uh, in the agreement that a bank may draw up or maybe a promissory note if you loan money to somebody else for some reason, um, you have certain terms and conditions. In this case, when Paul is talking about loving others, he basically took it off and said, under all circumstances, under all conditions, all situations, unconditional unlimited. So I asked this question next in your outline. Why was Jesus responsible for that debt? Kim, Kim Campbell said at the beginning and perfectly on the mark, she said that, you know, we have love as a debt in our lives because Jesus first paid that debt for us. He, he first loved us and he died on the cross. So why in the world did Jesus do that? 
I mean, your, your faith walk's kind of contingent on some of this, but why did Jesus do that to begin with? Why didn't God just simply say, you know what? I, I love you guys so much. I, I love you so unconditionally with such agape love that I'm just going to forget all about that. Why did Jesus have to pay that debt? Why was he responsible for it? By the way, there's about a thousand answers to this. Okay. But as usual, Doug chooses only a few. So you got to hit out of thousands, you got to hit just a few to get the, get the Adam boy. So, so what is it? Well, what's the reason that Jesus was responsible for this debt? Well, Doug, the one thing is, I think, uh, he opened up that we get all, all men and women can, uh, worship God, not just the Jews. Okay. That's good. That, that, that's, a, that's a fair answer. It's not one of the three I picked, Ralph, but it was a good one. <laughs> Anybody else? Pam, looks like I'll you're getting racist. I'll, I'll okay. I'm, bat, I'm batting a thousand here. How about fulfillment, okay. of pro, fulfillment of prophecy? That is an excellent choice. It's not one of the three that I picked, but it's, <laughs> it's an excellent one. Good. You can still call that batting a thousand because you're right, okay? Kim, you look like you were getting ready. Well, I'm not sure. Actually, let me hold and think on this a minute. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? To teach. Barb, you, you're kind of breaking up. Yes. It's something about to teach. Share love, continue the love he had for us. It's continuing the love he had for us. That, that's a good one. And that's, that's kind of one of those top ones that I would look at. So, so let, let's just look at our faith statement for a moment and think about the doctrine of why we love Jesus and Jesus loves us and God loves us. So remember that we have a God who is very clear about his purpose and plan for man. And God knew that when Adam and Eve sinned, that they had become separated from him. He wanted to create an opportunity where man could get back into relationship with him. Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit are always waiting for that relationship. In fact, Pastor Larry told a beautiful story this morning about a bridge building between two brothers who were, 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 uh, were having it out with each other. And, and so we cannot build that bridge to get to God. The only way that bridge can be built is it's a holy, holy bridge. And we aren't holy enough. We aren't good enough to build that bridge to get to God. So God knew that he had to provide the bridge and he was going to be the bridge builder. And that bridge is Jesus himself, who was holy. And as a result of him sacrificing his blood, we have the opportunity to cross that bridge that he built. We can't build it ourselves. Remember, you've heard me say this, and it's true. On my best day, on my best hour, my best minute, I'm not holy enough. And so I often challenge people that there is a scripture that says the prayers of a righteous man result in much. I am only able to call myself righteous because of the gift of the salvation of the cross, not because of something I've done, but because of something that he has done. So now I want you to think about this. Jesus was responsible for the debt that we owed because we sinned, humans, man, you, me, we have sinned. And the only way that debt can be paid is by the precious blood of sacrifice. And Jesus was the ultimate and final sacrifice for men because he was holy. And as a result, we have that debt paid for us by Jesus. Since he paid that debt for us, we have been made holy. Now, that doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean that we're going to get it right. It does mean that we are forgiven. 
today we celebrate in our church Holy Communion. Communion is one of those opportunities to remind us and to put us back in the right place in the framework of thought that says that we remember why Jesus died. And the Last Supper was that opportunity for us to go back to that and, and recognize it. And, and Pastor Larry got us there today with this unlimited or unconditional debt to love. So Jesus was responsible for the death because he chose to be and because he was the Lamb of God. And as a result, our debt is paid. So now with that being said, with the answer, and this is from your outline, with the answer we just came up with, how now do you answer the second question? The second question or outline is, why are we responsible for that death? If Why are we responsible for that obligation? If Jesus died for us so that we could spend eternity with him, that we could, that he built that bridge for us so we can get from here to there, why are we responsible for that debt? Because man is the one that sinned. Okay, so from an obligation standpoint, we're kind of paying it back maybe? Okay, that's that's fair. Anybody else? Was, Kim? Well, I was going to say um, because of God's um, changing from the old covenant to the new covenant, where we are to love one another and to be with other, you know, to be in tune with our Lord. That's a great answer too. Absolutely. Now, again, I want you though to dial this just a little bit. So originally we answered, why are we responsible for that debt? Because we have that obligation. That's fair. I also though want to twist your thinking just a little bit. I want to, I want to tweak it. And I want you to think now that when we recognize that Jesus was the ultimate obligator of our debt, another way that they used to say it for those who were slaves is I have been redeemed. I have been purchased. I have been bought out. My contract for obligation has been paid for. So it'd be much like if I owed on my house and someone came along and paid off the bank I no longer owe for the house because of somebody else's sacrifice. And because of that, I want to do something for them, don't I? Now, I want you to think about this. Earlier, we said we're obligated because Jesus paid the price for us, and that, that's fair. Um, we owe Jesus because he paid for our eternal life. That, that's fair. I also want you to think, though, out of gratitude, out of pure delight, out of love. Now, I feel obligated to that debt of unlimited love. And it looks a little different when it's out of gratitude, when it's out of love, when it's out of appreciation versus obligation. Now, I've got to confess to you, there are times as a Christian that I do things for others because it is an obligation. I do things for others because I feel that responsibility. And there are times as a Christian when I do things because of appreciation and simply because I love them unconditionally. The results are somewhat the same for them, but they're not the same for me. When I do things in my faith walk out of obligation, the results are usually pretty good, but I've missed the opportunity to see where God wanted this. Now, on the other hand, like I said earlier, if I do things because of I am just so gracious and, and I have so much gratitude that, that Jesus did all this for me and I fulfill my responsibilities, then the mindset is different, my heart's different, and the results are even better and different. And I walk away having recognized that I've been like Jesus versus 
I have fulfilled the responsibility because I had an obligation. Again, the results are somewhat the same for them, but for me, it's different. So I encourage you to think about, and we're going to go in real quickly here to, to some specifics in the scripture, but I just wanted you to get the big overarching picture and I use this opportunity for Pastor Larry to go into the unlimited or unconditional depth of love to try to convince you, to try to persuade you perhaps that as you look at your debt that we are responsible for as a result of Jesus dying on the cross, if you do it out of obligation, out of responsibility, because it's your responsibility, the results are usually pretty good. If you can do all of those things, though, because you have gratitude for what Jesus did for you, because you recognize it's your opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus by yourself or with others, then you personally will gain so much more and you'll recognize God in your life so much better. So perhaps look at your mindset and your attitude behind the things that you do. Again, obligation, we got it. You can't walk away from that. But to do it with pure, unconditional love and the graciousness that God wants us to do it for, you will gain so much more and you will be closer to Jesus than ever. Now, let's go to our outline real quick because in verse 11, there's some things I just wanted you to see in this that I didn't want you to miss today before we leave. And so 11 says this, and do this, understand the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. So another translation says, time to wake up. And one says, get to it, get to it. So I want you to hear the sense of urgency that Paul's given us. He's given us a sense of urgency here. It's important. And also in 11, it says this, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. So what does it mean salvation is nearer now? And there's a whole lot of answers to this. Anybody care to stab at it? Well, we're not guaranteed tomorrow, so get to it today. That's a great answer. Pammy, I saw you shaking your head. Are you are you losing? Hey, you losing courage there? <laughs> you were still about in a thousand. Okay, salvation is near now. Ralph, Ralph kind of hit the center core of that, and that is certainly um, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. So, um, but also I want you to recognize that that the timeline of God to return is not infinity. We don't know when it's going to be. We don't know whether it's going to be noon today or whether it's going to be 2,000 years from now. So the time of God's salvation for the world is now. And, and I don't want you to miss that. It's nearer now than it was yesterday. Look at verse 12. This is kind of interesting. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. What do you think Paul's saying when he says, put aside? Get rid of. That's a good way to put it. I want you to think of this. It, it could be somebody that uh, you supervise at work, perhaps uh, for you ladies, the husband that you supervise. Um, it could be, a, that was a joke, by the way. Um, it, it could be... Um, children. And there have been times when they were doing something and you recognized, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's something else you got to do first. And you may even say to them, all right, put that aside. Here's what I want you to do next. And that's what Paul's saying. Put some of the stuff we're doing aside and focus on this. So look at your life and see if there's something that's getting in the way of you doing what God calls you to do. I, I don't know what it is. Honestly, you've heard me say this a thousand times before, and I'll say it a thousand times again. I struggle sometimes figuring it out myself. What, what, is, what does God want me to set aside that's getting in the way of where he wants me to be? Think about that for your own life. Verse 13, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, 
not in dissension and jealousy. I just want you to notice one thing, carousing, drunkenness, sexual immorality, debauchery, dissension and jealousy all have the same level of, of importance. So we can condemn others for sexual immorality, but if we are jealous or we are causing dissension, God looks at it the same way. We're guilty of both. So be careful, all right? So behave decently as in, as in the daytime. And I put in parentheses, eyes are on us. And here's what I want you to get from that. As people of faith, if somebody knows that you go to church, if you've told somebody, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, I'm a person of faith, their eyes are on you. Sorry, it's responsibility. Sorry, you are under pressure. But nonetheless, be aware of that. And Paul recognizes that. He said, we are looked at. Our eyes, people's eyes are on us. Now look at 14. Rather, clothe, your, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Since we're getting short on time, let me help answer that for you. We're being told by Paul that we have to take off anything that gets in the way of us being identified as a Christian. What in your life may be keeping others from wanting to be believers? What in your life is, is making them think that person's a hypocrite? I'm not suggesting that we have to prove ourselves to anybody, but eyes are on us. And as a result, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning you cover yourself with his persona, with his behavior, with his modeling, with his examples. And then again in 14, your last question of the day, do not think how to gratify the desires of the flesh, question mark. That means we're shifting our thinking. We're shifting our thinking. Perhaps it's a habit for you. Perhaps it's a thought pattern. Perhaps it's a behavior or combination thereof. But it becomes a, a way to look at things. So listen again to it. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. It's a matter of viewpoint or perspective. So think about this. As you look at life, we often describe it this way at our church, time, talent, and treasure. In other words, the time that you invest, the talent that you have, and you've worked on your experience, your education, your abilities, your gifts, and then also your treasure or money, if you will, your assets. How do you look at those things and how do you treat them? So, Rather than think about how you use all those time, talent, and treasures just to take care of yourself and just to satisfy yourself, are you using some of that for the kingdom? And that's an answer you have to come up with. I promise you there are times when I'm guilty of satisfying myself and my, my desires long before I do God's. And maybe if we dial it one degree at a time, we get eventually to where God would like us to be. So the final answer at the bottom in italicized letters, are you willing to pay your love debt? And I believe Pastor Larry's challenge does well today to think about how do we pay back the unlimited, unconditional love that God has given us? And how do we pay that back? Each of us has to answer that individually. Each of us has to figure that out. So this week, I encourage you to read, whether it's like a newspaper, read it pretty quickly, or whether you want to do it word by word, read Romans. It's a great book. Pastor Larry has challenged as well. Unlimited debt to love. And that debt is unlimited because we have a God who unconditionally and unlimited ways loves us and cares for us. And he showed that by paying the price with his son, Jesus, on the cross, even to death and finally to resurrection. Let's end the prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you that 
You love us in an unlimited, unconditional way. Help us, Lord, to do the same with others. And for some of us, Lord, help us to love ourselves that way. Help us to give ourselves some grace and a little mercy once in a while. Because God loves us no matter what. And Lord, through all of this, help us to be more like Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Have a great week.